I'd like to welcome you to the first workshop of the day here. Um, Gorilla Innovation Bootstrap Methods to Grow Your Business. I am uh, happy to introduce to you um, James and Angeline Street. Angeline um, is with Stellar Food Group, and my notes here tell me that she has used her 25 plus years. Um, wait, wait, yeah, shh, don't say that out loud. Uh, a high-end retail experience to help create winning sales strategies and attractive merchandise displays. Angeline has a deep understanding of customer needs, perceptions, and behaviors, and she's uh, honed this to a, an art with her marketing courses at Vancouver Island University. Angeline has created a toolbox of thrifty and free methods to help her business reach the next level. So we look forward very much to hearing about that. Um, and James Street, I, I'm guessing you guys go together. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, Stellar Food Group, uh, and James is a Red Seal chef. Mm, some of my very best friends are Red Seal chefs. James has over 25 years experience that's a little bit of it that works together too in the food, and, um, food service and food manufacturing industries. Uh, James has been a long time advocate and promoter of local food, thank you James, and uh, has been involved in the development of many local and regional food security projects through Vancouver Island. James is currently pursuing a degree in business at the Vancouver Island University and he sits on the board of directors at the Cedar Farmers Market as the director of marketing, advertising and web communications. Looking very much forward to your session. I'll hand it over to you. Uh, you know where to find us if there's anything that we can help you with along the way. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, first, thank yous to the Kelowna First Nations for allowing us to be here today. Thank yous to the BCAFM, City of Kelowna, the Delta Grand Hotel, many volunteers that are helping make all this possible today. I just want to talk a little bit about um, what our what our workshop is on today, but just a little bit of a background about myself, and then I'll pass the microphone over to Angeline, and she can tell you a little, a little bit about herself. I come from a, a family that came to Vancouver Island when it was still a colony back in the 1870s, and we started, well, they started knocking trees down and making farmland back then. So food's been a, a part of my life, even going further generations back. We. Uh, at a grocery store called Bramble's Market uh, back in 2008. It was uh, all local produce from, or not just produce, it was... Full service grocery store, the first one in Canada. Yeah, we had everything from jelly beans to soy sauce. <laughs> and uh, we were a little ahead of our time, it didn't, it didn't work out for us. We were, we're sticking to the local food commitment and we still have other ventures on the go. The latest one being Stellar Food Group and our primary brand in that is Whole Hog Farms. And Bullock Farms is a line of sausages. Um, I'll pass the microphone over now and imagine you can tell you a bit about yourself. You don't really want to hear about me, I'm sure, but I really just like selling and we really like food in our family. We have two kids that are teenagers, they work for us, they work with us, they're an integral part of our business and everything that we do revolves around food and just making things yummy and delicious and enjoying life. So that's kind of our, our philosophy. So <clears throat> we've been doing this for five years. Um, we started out with a $500 investment after our grocery store. Um, and we've doubled our sales year over year for the last five years. So we're doing okay. We're making a living at this. This is our full-time gig. Um, and one of the things one of the reasons why we wanted to do this workshop is because we started with a $500 investment. We had no money for marketing, we had no money for advertising. So these are the things that we've tried out, that we've learned over the years that have helped us grow. So. Um, well, we wanted to just table what, what innovation is. And innovation scares a lot of people. They think, oh, I can't come up with something new. I I can't come up with something that's, that's brand new and exciting and it's going to stop people in their tracks when they walk by. It doesn't really have to be that innovative, to use the buzzword. It, it just has to be that little different. It has to catch their attention. It has to stop and make them think. And, you know, there's there's the, the one end of it where someone will have a, a jar of canned cherries and they'll say that it's gluten-free just as a little bit of a joke to kind of catch your attention. And, and we, we've all heard about, you know, the 
what that uh, what that creates. But we just wanted to kind of introduce at this workshop. There's a real theme of innovation going on at the whole conference. You look at the other workshops and the other talks. I'm um, seeing some nods there. Yeah. We the industry itself for farmers markets is really starting to gather some momentum. And as it's been spoken to before, the what farmers markets were 10 years ago, I'm sure everyone could agree. When you look around a farmers market now, the breadth of materials, the, the expansive products, and, and the and the quality of the products that are out there is is remarkably different. So as we're gaining momentum, as we're trying to get the industries um, that are there or sorry the governments that are working with us to try and give us the support that we need. We need to try and keep this momentum going and, and keep pushing the industry forward and that comes from innovation. You, you just get into that mindset of always looking at your product and being confident with your product. Like yes, I have a quality product, quality service, and so on, but is there a way that I can tweak it just a little bit, make it a little bit better? Not just for me, but in, in all just all the um, all the categories, so in your product offering, in how you market and how you communicate, and then at your point of sale, which is your your booth display there. There's a, a real resistance for a lot of farmers market vendors to say, well, no, I'm not retail, no, I'm not a business, I don't want to be, but you have to look at it from your consumer's perspective. Yes, you are a business, you have the benefit of being the business and the producer, and often in many cases, but you are a business. And if we're going to move this industry forward, we need to try and, and, and get into that mindset a little bit. So, when we ask why we need to innovate, uh, we kind of try and think of the, to use the university term that has been pounded into me lately, is we have to look at all the stakeholders. And the primary stakeholder for, for the success and growth of your business is you. You need to pay your bills, you need to pay your market fees, you need to you know, keep everything going. But as well, the innovation comes from the consumer's perspective as well. They, this is your competition out there, and they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars in capturing everybody's attention. So any little way that you can do that helps with you. And then again, as I just spoke to the industry itself, you want to try and keep pushing things forward for the betterment of, of the industry. I think that it's really important to remember that we are a business and that we are in direct competition to the grocery stores. The grocery stores have really upped the ante and we have to keep up. We offer a very different experience at market, but we have to keep in mind that people are busy, they have limited incomes that they're willing to spend all their, their money on. Um, and we have to make it a really great experience at market. It's one thing to have a great product, but if the entire experience isn't awesome, there's no reason why they're not going to the grocery store and getting their toilet paper and their laundry soap and everything at the same time, they can whip in in half an hour, get everything they need for the week, and be done. We're asking them to make an extra trip, so we have to provide entertainment and value and benefits that the grocery store can't offer. We have to offer relationships with our customers. And I think we're getting better at doing those kind of things, but there's still a lot of work to be done, and there's not enough recognition that we are in direct competition every single day with grocery stores that have $50 million marketing budgets, $150 million marketing budgets. They're, they're giving that message every single day, hundreds of times a day, that it's easier to shop at the grocery store. Um, at the, we do five different markets in a weekend, uh, one on the Friday um, show. And uh, two on a Saturday, two on a Sunday, so it's, it's a busy weekend. We are are very much positioned as the innovators within our in our group uh, within the markets, and we have a lot of other vendors watching what we're doing very carefully. Um, there's there's definitely a resistance to try something new because you're you have a lot invested in the day to day. It's it's hard to try to get the courage and the finances in a lot of cases. Well, what if I make this too? And, you know, there's a lot of approvals, there's, you know, there's, there's vetting to, to take into consideration, there's a lot to it, so it, it's high risk. And what we found 
in our in our past, uh, Angeline put her high end retail background, and myself put being a chef for, for 20 years. There's there's two ways you can approach it. And when I was a uh, younger chef, I had to copy everybody. I was reading the magazines. This was before Food Network, of course, but reading the magazines and, and traveling around and tasting different chefs' uh, menu offerings, and that's how I learned to build my my own skills, my own repertoire. And then we found that in the last couple of years with our business with the sausages and uh, later on as a chef, you you start to become the, the trendsetter. You start to become the people, or yeah, you start to become the people that other people are copying. And as frustrating as that can be, when you launch a new product at farmer's market, I'm sure there, there are other people that, that look around, like you, you're the brave one, you're the one that's put the investment down and taken the risk, and you've put product X on your table, and you, you, you know the people that can buy an whole just look at the see what you got there. And then a couple weeks later, you see that show up at their table. That's a bit of a, bit of a hit to take, and, and we totally appreciate that. But we, we've we chosen to become the uh, like number two there. We're going to own it. We're going to be the, the people that people are trying to copy, and we're going to be the innovators, and we're going to push things forward. We'll just take it as a compliment when things are starting to show up at other vendors' booths, we'll just say, well, that, like I said, is a good idea. Yeah, we're, it's starting to get traction with us, but if, if it's starting to get traction with them, then I think we're onto something here. And that's how we're pushing the industry forward. And that's how we're creating a better experience for our, for our farmers market. Yeah, I'll go to the next one here. But I just want to kind of get you in a, into the headspace for, for products here. Um, when you're going to copy someone, you have to try to think like an anthropologist. And one of our favorite things to do at the farmer's market is watch our customers. Yes, we have sales to do, and yes, we have things to do, but we love watching how our customers engage with our booth and how they approach the booth. And has anyone seen a unicorn at the farmer's market? <laughs> Does anyone know what a unicorn is? A unicorn comes up and you say, oh, hi, you know, welcome to the farmer's market. How can I help you? And the unicorn says, oh, um, yeah, I'm just I'm looking for some information, and they, they seem a little, you know, flustered. They're not really sure why they're there, and the boy just, I'll, I'll be right back. I'm, I'm going to catch you on my way out of the market, and you never see them again. <laughs> so, and <laughs> that's our that's our favorite spot of unicorns. We'll often say at the end of the day, how many unicorns did you see today? I saw three at Cedar, two at Arrington this weekend. And then there's what's the other one? The time vampires. Yes. Time vampires. Um, I'll I'll lead up to to Angeline with her with her signage uh, right after the product uh, line. But she, she can speak to it with the display in the booth here, just to introduce what we're talking about. Um, Time vampires really gave us a push to to innovate our signage. Signage is one thing you see a lot of signage all over farmers market. You try to put everything, you try to answer every question you possibly can. But it was the time vampires that really required a lot from us. We don't grow the animals that we turn into our line of sausages. We use pork, chicken, and lamb. As an example, I went through what, close to 200 lamb last year, and we had well over 500 hogs, and I don't even want to count how many chickens. Uh, and we have a lot of farms in Vancouver Island that we pull from, and it's, it's too many to list, and it changes every week because. Farmer Bob has pork this week, and and down the road has pork the following two weeks. So it's, we didn't want to rotate through all that, but we wanted to answer all the questions that we get every day. And the time vampires will stand there and ask you, well, where is this from? What's in this? Is that in there? And is that in there? And is that what about this? And they, they work through every every list on your on your product line there. And then meanwhile, you have folks that are in a hurry to stand behind you. And, trying to get in there and buy something, they're in a hurry, the kids are pulling on their skirt, and then you see a unicorn fly by. <laughs> I saw that one again. Yeah. And then, uh, so the, the time vampire really made us both uh, different zones to put into our booth. So I'll pass the mic over to Angeline, and she can talk about the three zones. This was an innovation that we did, rather than just having a standard sign in the back. You want to talk to that bit? Okay. Don't follow any food blogs. How many? Hold your hands up high. A couple, okay. Um, great spot for transplanting and you know, social media, of course. Um, 
who has a Facebook page for their business. Oh, that's better. That's better. We've um, a few of the markets we've been at. We're trying to drag them into this century and get get some of the vendors to get a Facebook page. But, um, you need to drag into the last century. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. The um, products that we've created for our for our line of sausages. We start off with what five or seven, eight. Okay, and stand here corrected. Eight products that we had, and they were pretty mainstream. They were they were pretty white bread. They really hit all the bases for for most customers that we were targeting. But we really started to look at who our customers were that were coming to the market, and we needed to differentiate ourselves from the growers who were like producing their own sausages. So pork producer down the down the south there would make an Italian sausage, and we had an Italian sausage. Well, we were losing up to the grower himself because he's allowed to stay stand there and say, well, I, I grew the pork and I made the sausages. So by default, we, we lost out. So we started to experiment with different flavors and we really looked to the, the palate of Vancouver Island and it's, it's definitely a foodie culture down there. So we started developing flavors such as uh, the chicken tandoori and Thai ginger chicken sausages and so on. Lab out there. Mango yeah. date. Lamb with mango and date, yeah. another one, citrus and fig, like just out there, like flavors that I would use in restaurants a lot uh, over the years. And I knew the flavor combinations worked, but it was something in a sausage now that people just, it would really stop them in their tracks and look at the signs. And they'd see the Thai ginger chicken and they'd see the citrus and fig and they'd go, wow, well, I'd never seen anything like that at the farmer's market before. And it just, it, it turned those unicorns, at least into the next stage, turned them into a time vampire. So we could, just get them, get them in the booth, you know. And the, uh, sorry, turn my page. We, we would start to experiment a lot with the, um, with the naming of it, you know, just to try to, we have, um, what is it, the, the Thai ginger chicken, or sorry, no, the Moroccan one, the Merguez, we're going to turn into tangiers and try to, to play around with the naming a little bit just to, to keep things fresh. Innovation doesn't have to be something that's such a wholesale change that it's entirely different for you to, to, to initiate or to manage. It just has to be a subtle tweak. And you have to pay attention and watch your customers and see how they react to it. If you hear people outside your booth, this is where the, you know, your inner anthropologist comes in. If you, if you hear the people outside the booth commenting on on the signs that they see and seeing the flavors and nodding and smiling at one another and nodding and pointing, then you know you're on something. You need to do more of that. You need to reward that behavior and then have you know, something on the inside of the booth that we'll get into later that'll, that'll draw them a little further in. Um, demographics really helped us steer our portion size. The the products were always in a package of four. We're, we're not the, the cheapest sausage out there on the market by any means. Uh, not the most expensive, but they're not cheap. I'll, I'll, I'll come out and say it. But the, the portion size for the four pack was what, about eight or ten dollars. Angeline, much to my disagreement, um, initiated that we would do packages of two and packages of three. So of course the inner chef manager and me is like, well, it's twice the packaging, that's twice the work, so I'm looking at it from the manufacturing point of view. And what are we going to do if nobody wants packs of two? We're going to have to visualize and unwrapping them, wrapping them back as packages of four, and so on. But it was a phenomenal success. And not only that, it, um, it started bringing in a whole new clientele in terms of demographics that we weren't targeting yet. And she started marketing the product not just as um, a sausage on its own, but as an ingredient in, in something else. So rather than just having a grilled Thai ginger chicken sausage. She was explaining to people that as a product, it's, it has many different uses. Where the innovation comes in is just is how you sell it. And, that's it. and in the restaurant world, we always said sell the sauce. The, the, uh, the sausage itself is, is very good, but you gotta sell how they're gonna prepare it. And she would sell the Thai ginger chicken as an ingredient in the, the bon mi sandwiches and so on. So then they start, well, so then they start to have this idea of what the meal is they're going to prepare and they look at their tote bag, oh, I have lettuce, and I have peppers, and I have sprouts. 
I'm just going to go get some bread and a pack of sausages and then I'm off on my way. But it, by opening up to those other demographics, um, it was key in, uh, in doubling our skills year after year. And we'll get into uh, more of the demographics a little later. Uh, that's really a, a geeky passion of mine is in the demographics now that we're, that we're on to. So this is my one of my big passions. Please, please look at your market and figure out who your customers are and take into account their eating habits. Uh, we know on the island that 40%, maybe more, of our market are singles, seniors. They eat less. So we're still putting out these big, giant, lovely bunches of kale, but a lot of these seniors and singles are just going, oh, well, that's pretty, and they keep walking by, because that's too big a portion for them, and they're thinking, oh my god, I'm going to be eating this for the next five days, and they don't want to eat kale for five days. They want to eat it for one day, maybe two. That's enough. I mean, when we're talking about taking on new cuts or packaging something differently or different size packages or the salad kits, Shoot for about 10%, and if it if it doesn't work, you know, it, it has to be your own comfort level. Try it for a couple of weeks. Make sure you try it on a rainy day, and a sunny day, and a busy day, and a slow day, and then take those notes and, and see if it goes. And you have your your early adopters, your people that show up when the rain is coming sideways, and they're the ones that try the new product every time. They're the ones that walk up to the table and what's new, what's fresh, what what didn't I get last week? These are the customers that know the names of their kids. Those early adopters are the other ones that you need to target. So in the growth curve for, for marketing, you learn that you have these early adopters that will try and they're also the first ones to tell you if they like it or if they don't. We have a lot of success with our sausages. We have some people that come in, yep, that one didn't work for me at all. And there's our opportunity rather than taking offense to that. And as a, a chef for 20 odd years who really took offense to Anybody didn't like anything that I made. It, it took a lot for me to to ask for that information and ask for that feedback, and then turn that into an innovation. What did you like about it? And often it was such a subtle little tweak that by by using these early adopters and, and narrowing in and, and rifling down what what you have. Sorry, hold the pineapple. Our chunks were too big. We did a pork and pineapple, pineapple sausage, kind of a Caribbean flavor sausage, and we tried it and tried it, and a lot of people tried it first, no repeat purchases. Just, we're stuck and we tasted it, we're like, yeah, it's good, it's good. But it wasn't until one of our early adopters, one of our VIPs, and uh, ones that are there every week, we, we finally asked them, like, well, you, you bought the pineapple, but you, you've been kind of awkward, you didn't really talk about it, and so here we are, we're, we're putting our head on the block. What didn't you like about it? Why didn't you buy it anymore? Oh, we just thought the chunks of pineapple were just a little bit too big. Well, it's, it's, it's a subtle little thing. Okay, well, I'll, I'll chop it for five more minutes. I won't go for a coffee break right away. And, just, and get those things dialed in. But you've got to you've got to watch what your customers want. You've got to watch what other people are doing. You have to learn from that. Engage with your customers. Retool. Don't be afraid to just do a subtle twist and then apply that again. And then that cycle never stops. This is where we can differentiate ourselves from the grocery stores. This, um, make your customers happy that you are tailoring your product to their needs and set yourself apart from your competition. So if you listen to your customers and they don't like big chunks of pineapple, put small chunks in. They'll be happy because you've listened to their feedback and you've made those changes. And so they feel invested in your product. They like you, they like your product, and you're working by offering smaller portions or doing whatever, offering kits. You're tailoring your product to what they need, rather than just going to the grocery store and buying a five kilo bag because that's the only thing that's available. Just a quick little list of uh, some of the things that have worked for us in the past. And we sampled very heavy for the first couple of years as we were trying to hold our own against the grower processors as opposed to just us as a processor. And the signage was always a work in progress. We had beta versions that Anjing would make up on the white chloroplast with some some pictures we did on, on the internet or printed 
print it off and then had, it looked like a science fair project. We got a lot of, it was, it was a lot of ribbing about that, but we were trying to, to look as to where our customers were, were looking for information because not everybody walks into the booth in the same way. And if you have information in the wrong spot, they don't find it. Someone comes along behind them and who's really in a hurry, they're gone and, and you lose them. And we really looked at how we communicated. We'll get into some of that a bit later, but, and offering different products. And again, just trying to get it, take everything from the customer's point of view. Um, something that uh, myself and Angeline both had a lot of experience with in, in, in retail and as a chef is you're consumer driven. Yes, as a chef, I, I really want to have you know a, a pistachio crusted halibut on the menu, and I want to have a pickled ginger butter sauce on that because I want to eat that for my staff meal on Friday. I'm going to sell it and I'm going to make money on it, but I still had to prepare it in a way that the 200 customers that I was hoping to sell to that night also bought it. So, how many of you know a farmer that's been doing the same thing for 15 years? <laughs> How many of you know that person and they bitch and belly moan, uh, belly ache and moan because their sales are dropping because somebody new is doing a different type of tomato and they're still selling beef steaks and 14 other vendors are selling beef steaks and they're losing out to the guy that's selling green zebras and black prints and paste tomatoes and everything else. We all know these people. I know them. This comes back to the 10% rule. Try something new. See what your customers want. Be willing to try something new. Just because it worked 15 years ago doesn't mean that it works today. Just because it worked last year doesn't mean it's going to work today. So go outside of your own personal comfort zone a little bit. And just because it's always been done one way doesn't mean it's the right way forever. So five years to markets. Five sets of signage over the years because we started out with little basic signs and then we went to a bigger sign and then we did the chloroplast because one of my things is trying to answer questions. So you have regular questions that get asked at every single market. So figure out what those questions are at every single market and design your signage. So. I wanted to know, because we had so many questions about what are the main flavors. So I did this big chloroplast because we had no money. So I bought chloroplast and I printed out little signs and I got some little clippy things and I stuck them on the chloroplast. And people started saying, oh, well I like that one because it's got sage in it. And oh, well, that one looks good because it's got lemon in it. And because you had a visual. So then I knew, okay, I'm on the right track because I'm giving them clues and cues as to what the in ingredients are. So then the next year, I redesigned the signage again. So it had those components. Still wasn't answering enough questions. And then year five, finally, I felt, OK, I can order banners. Woo! So $50 at Vistaprint for anybody that hasn't ordered from Vistaprint. Yeah, that's the big one on the back, with rods. Yeah, just so you know. Um, so you'll notice in this side or this picture, this is a bad picture because that sign's at the back. Guess where we stand? So we moved it to the side above the freezers. Suddenly, it's totally accessible. We have people that are walking in going, "Oh my God, that looks so good! Wow!" We had signs on both sides of the tent. Big mistake. Same banner, two sides. They thought that we had 40 flavors now because they saw two signs. Totally didn't work. So back to the one sign again. We have um, zones outside. This is another case of watching the customers. This is for unicorns out here. This mm -hmm. catches them when they're running by. Okay, so this is me. No, actually, this is you. Okay, here's a booth. So you have a lot of people that stand out here. They're looking, oh my God, what are the prices like? Mm, I don't know. But they don't really want to come up and say, hey, how's it going? What do you got? Because they're shy, they're nervous, they're in a hurry, whatever. So this exterior signage lets them stand back here. The font is this big. So they can read. 
that's cool. Oh, and this is where they get their stuff from. Oh, okay, now they can come in. Now they look at the big menu board. And then they can see better what we're doing. Then they have a question about price. Well, it's right here. And they want to know our company name. It's down here. And they want to know we have allergies. Tons of allergies. So that was another big question for us. We designed a page that's totally accessible, easy to see. If you have allergies, here's a list of the things that you can buy. It made it easy for our customers because we actually gave them a piece of paper that they could shop from. So if they had garlic allergy, there was a list of all the flavors. So we say gluten allergy, or gluten allergy, they were good across the board, but dairy and, and so on. So it's really important that you watch how your customers are entering your booth how they interact with your booth out here, because you're losing a lot of sales. Your bunch of kale is too big. They're looking at that kale going, oh, maybe until somebody's got something smaller. So they walk around and walk around until they find what they're looking for. So exterior signage, exterior things that are going to draw their interest. If you've got Romanesca uh, cauliflower today, put it up front, make it look cool. Get them excited about coming in. Give them a reason to come in besides date squares or whatever. If you have date squares, say, yeah, they're your grandma's date squares because that's going to appeal to a lot of people because they want to remember what grandma's date squares were like and they can't buy those at the grocery store. Quick little note on font. Take the average age of your customer, divide by two, that's the font you should have. <laughs> That's a good um, formula. Works for PowerPoints, works for presentations, also works for signage. The other thing that we did was color our freezers. We had dinged up freezers and whatever else. This is where the people laughed at us screen. Um, they were kind of yucky. I wanted to do something interesting. I could have bought white paint and painted them over. I thought, why? So I did a lot of research on color psychology. Yellow is a good color. It inspires creativity. It inspires you to stop and slow down. It inspires you to eat. It gives you comfort and knowing that you're getting a good product and all those things. So we did yellow freezers. All the vendors in our markets are going, painted hey, their freezers yellow. <laughs> There's people that are painting their freezers now <laughs> or their fridges because now we have people that are at the other end of market and they're talking to their friends and they go, oh, well, where, where'd you get those? Well, just go look for the place with the yellow freezers. Now, we have a trademark. Look for the yellow freezers and the black signs and you can't miss it. We're differentiating ourselves from the other meat vendors. It's an easy, easy thing. This is the wickedest book. It's called um, Why We Buy from Paco Underhill. And he talks about bum brush. So you know when you're in the little store and you're in the aisles and it's really crowded and you're trying to get down here to get your crackers and somebody walks by and they're like, that's bum brush. <gasps> don't do that. It really offends people. It wakes them out. They don't like it. They don't, and if your booth is crowded and you don't have a proper space for them to come and go, they're not going to go to your booth because they don't want to be. People's bags and their bums and their shoulders and everything else. So keep those things in mind. How do your customers go into your booth? How do they come back out again? Can they stand out here and read your signs? Because if you have a lineup, oh, I hope you have lineups. We got lineups for the first time really this year on a consistent basis, and we're high fiving each other every time. Yeah, we're finally here because. You know, when you have three people that are standing there waiting to pay and get their stuff, you want to be able to give them a place that they can still see everything that's going on, answer their questions, and then they can feel confident coming in, going, hey, those look really cool, I want to pack. If you're a funny person, if you like having fun with your customers, put some fun info out there, put some fun signs. If you're going to introduce a new product, please, Tell people how to use it. If you sell Romanesco broccoli, cauliflower, doesn't matter what that one is. Um, people think it looks really cool, but 
but nobody knows how to chop it up. Nobody knows whether they're supposed to steam it or stir fry it or bake it or eat it raw or anything like that. Give them some signage. Give them that confidence that they can look at like the cat. Say, hey, this is sweeter than cauliflower. It's awesome. And all you have to do is whack it up and I'll throw it in the steamer. <laughs> Put some butter on it. It's awesome. Yeah, I've had uh, I've sold um, devils, wild crafted devils. more because you're giving them a kit. You're making it easy for them to buy that product from you and to try it out. Well, the, the gloves are, uh, just, if anybody can hear, uh, stinging that will be sold with a recipe and a pair of gloves to handle them with. Excellent you know, little trick to just put yourself above the competition and just that little bit of innovation. So if someone's looking around for nettles, they know the nettles sting. And if you have a package that has a pair of your friendly gloves in there, you're going to win. So I want to just really quickly talk about uh, my new hobby, demographics, the psychographics, and you know, I'm taking marketing in university, but we talk a lot about that. But we're talking about understanding your customer, and I've got a few things I want to talk to you about this. I do the marketing for the Cedar Farmers Market, again, trying to drag them into this century using social media and so on. I used uh, social media in combination with a little bit of understanding of demographics. This is my new Bible here. This is the Financial Post Markets Canadian Demographics 2012. It's available at just about every public library. There are versions of it available online for free. As can has very similar information. So the information that you see up here is, is, is taken from this. And we wanted to use Kelowna as an example. I'm really impressed with the diversity in Kelowna. So, Imagine everyone that you're you're selling at the Kelowna Farmers Market, and you say, okay, you look around and you drive around, you look at lots of restaurants, and I see young people, and I see older people, and I see families, and I see jacked up trucks with rifles in the back, and it, it looks pretty diverse, but I think I've got an understanding as to what I'm selling, so you, you put your, your products out to the Farmers Market. What I found really interesting about Kelowna is that in this book, there are 60 different consumer purchasing profiles that they outline. 27 of those exist in Kelowna. Usually it's about 14 in a Yeah. Yeah, so incredibly diverse. The top three groups in that are 35% are of the population. So if you're at the farmer's market, you're already only servicing maybe 1 or 5% of the population as it is. You need to make sure that of that 5% that's coming, your products align with the consumer needs of those of 35% of those. They have and they have very different needs. So the the tea and good books um, cohort, I believe is the, is the word, uh, 19,000 of of Kelowna's residents have very different needs than the the tenants in 20s. The the tenants in 20s are your the, the millennial generation that they don't quite own their home yet. They often buy something in groups, they travel in groups, and so on. The team good books are actually score very high on the widow and widower spectrum. So the next gen rising, a lot of uh, folks from uh, parents outside of Canada. So as as you can imagine, whether you're selling carrots or, or stewing beef, there are different tweaks that you can do to like proportion size or, or, or flavors. If you have a, you know, a large population of folks from out of Canada, well, just you know, apple and sage may not cut it. It may be something a little bit more, more punch, maybe a bit more excitement. Tenants and 20s, they're, they're looking at a smartphone. Like this is how you see them walking down the street. So it's, you, you've got to communicate to them here. They're not going to read a newspaper ad, and they're especially not going to read a newspaper ad when they're grocery shopping. So just a quick little example, when I took over the marketing for Cedar, I had a very small marketing budget. My entire marketing budget for the year is, is well at that time was less than $2,000. Um, a lot of other markets in the area spend that just on newspaper advertising. So I thought, okay, I've got $2,000, I'm gonna make this count. And I was experimenting with Facebook. Facebook 
has incredible tools where you can select these sorts of, of, of demographics and psychographics. Not as accurately as this. You can't just click on the T into the books column, unfortunately. Maybe I should write an email to him. And, but what you can select is based on, on lifestyle preferences or when, who's on Facebook again? Quick show of hands. Okay. Facebook knows exactly what you're interested in based on what you browse, what you view, what groups you join, what, what your so friend's uh, group, yeah, it's, it's a massive algorithm and it's mathematically exciting. But the, um, the key is, is that this is where your, your anthropologist comes in. We were looking around the cedar farmer's market and trying to understand, okay, who's, who's the target market that we're not accessing yet? Because the, the, most of the people that were coming in were kind of 25, 45 year old women that's not everybody in town. We have 100,000 people in the mile. We started seeing a lot of tattoos. Think about it. Think about who you're, who you're seeing in the market. Yeah. A lot of tattoos. Well, at, at ours it was, yeah. I don't know if it's going to show up on everybody's, but the, we started seeing tattoos. And you see when they're on their arm and they're purchasing, and you see them walking by in the summertime and they're covered in tattoos. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's pretty neat. And then when I was looking through the lifestyle purposes on Facebook as I'm doing my marketing, and I've selected younger people, I, I can split my advertising on Facebook down to ages, let's say for example, 20 to 30 years old, or say 18 to 30 years old. And I started going through the lifestyles, and I'm doing all the, all the usual ones, someone interested in local food, someone interested in organic, farms, family, so on. And then I saw tattoos, I'm like, wow, actually that's really interesting, I selected that one. And Yoga. And yoga, yeah, was another one. So anyone who's interested in yoga, all of a sudden is going to get this ad in front of them. And that's not something they're going to get when they're when they're looking in their you know, yoga magazine. It's something, not something they're going to be looking for in the newspaper. You're, you're, you're penetrating that new market. You're kind of going against the grain with, with advertising and going right to the people that are, some of them are already coming, but you want more of them to attend. So I, long story short, I took this whole marketing campaign, I think I spent $35. And I split it roughly three ways. It's okay, millennials, which is essentially your, I use these three as well because they, they support the cedar story. Millennials, tenants, and 20s, I, I selected them, went through all the attributes, kind of a middle-aged group selected all the attributes, and then the older clientele selected all the attributes. Send off to Facebook. In three days, this is for our opening day, we normally average about 1,500, people through on the market. We had roughly 4,000 people through on our, on our opening day. The Facebook campaign went, as, as much as Facebook can go viral, it went viral. I had over 19,000 hits in three days. And what I found really interesting, especially was the tenants and 20s, the millennials, because they were tagging their friends in the, in the post. You know, Bobby Joe, that's let's go to this, this weekend, and then they share that, and so-and-so would chime in, and yes, so it was, it was organically you know, stretching out, so we were appealing to, to these different groups, and when I did the three different campaigns, I made sure that my, my infographic was different for all three of those people. Again, it's that awareness of, of who you're talking to. The tenants and 20s, my infographic was a group of young people all shopping together, and it, it, it's that simple, it was a free, image off the internet, it had nothing to do with Cedar Farmer's Market on its own, but that's how they shop, that's how they identify. So they, oh, that's, that's kind of the way I shop, and, oh, it's here, and it's close, and it's this weekend, and I'm going. Whereas the, the middle group, the Next Gen Rising, we had a picture of a family eating food together with a little caption on their local food as part of our meals every weekend, and off that went. And then we had, for the, the top cohort there, for the, for the older clientele, we had smaller portions, you know, customizable service. You start thinking about all those things that are important to, to those generations. And by splitting that marketing up, it, it still only cost me $35. It was, it was free for me to split that $35 up into three different groups and then and, and try marketing them directly. So, right, so the, the sign reads for anyone who can't read the uh, resolution, the most damaging phrase in the language is, it's always been done. And, and again, the whole the theme of this workshop is to try to you know, put that bit of a spark in and just get you to, to look at everything you're doing. Like, be proud of the quality that you're doing. Like, 
people that are in this room are the people that are pushing this stuff forward and collectively as farmers market we're we're disrupting how the food system is working when the superstore puts out a brand of pies called farmers market brand pies you know we have influence so we need to try and keep this momentum going let's keep the big guys thinking let's keep them on their feet they're trying to copy us now so now it's our turn to to keep steering things Any questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, thank you so much, both of you, for your presentation. Uh, sure. Yeah, you can take the microphone. Sure. Thanks. So I'm here from the UBC Farm, and I also happen to have a background in business analyst. <laughs> um, so you spoke a lot about understanding your customers, listening to them on the farmer's market. I'm just wondering for the crowd here that how do you, do you have any sort of resource where it's easier to get those demographic data? Because like we spoke a lot about just listening, but one of us may not feel like we're just gonna experience with this new kind of cauliflower. Okay, I look terrified. Well, let everyone look. What is it? The financial post, Canadian demographics. So I'm guessing that's available probably online as well. <coughs> There is an online version, that you have to but pay it's for. not a very good version. Yeah. Um, but you can go to your library. I think it's in every single library. Often you cannot take it out, but you're welcome to stand there and photocopy the appropriate pages. And you stand it's there really with your great. Actually, um, it's a really good resource. Thank you. Can, can I make a comment actually to answer some of that? Um, well, there is one that is available. I mean, it's on the internet. Uh, it's um, there's one source that's uh, available on the internet, uh, and it's through Realtor.ca. And if you look at your local, I mean, you go to your map, look at your local area or however it is, and you'll see all these dots of houses for sale. Pick a house in the area, and uh, you'll see a little um, tag called demographics, and it'll show you. You know how many speak are you know um, English speakers in your neighborhood versus um, various other languages? How many people own their homes? Uh, their education levels? Um, there's a whole lot of you know various pie charts with percentages, so you can actually very quickly sort of look at your area and, and sort of where people are coming from and have a very good idea of how you can um, uh, customize what products you grow. Or sell uh, to those individuals. One of the things that that book gives you is exactly how many dollars are spent on grocery in your area. Um, how much the uh, per each, household. Yeah, per household. Uh, what the income levels are in each neighborhood and things like that. So there's a tremendous amount of really important information in there. Uh, just before we take the next question. Uh, with our sort of my marketing with Cedar this year, I identified a cohort in Nanaimo that I didn't know existed to the scale in which it existed. Uh, the cohort is called Rods and Rifles. You can kind of get a loose idea of the type of person that we're talking about there. Um, and it, it joins my efforts to try to, to target who isn't coming to the market. Like we have a lot of moms coming to market. I don't see a lot of dads coming to market. Or if dad's coming to market, he's kind of but very much like me when I'm at market, I'm kind of go around behind and you know, shell some money for it. And, oh, you want some of that? Sure, yeah, go get that. And so I'm trying to think of how I'm going to, to, to market to the dad. So my next mission and this year, and definitely you know, follow Cedar Farmers Market on, on Facebook and watch what I'm doing. Copy it, please. Like The more, more of this we have, the better. If you have ideas or so on, throw it out there. Uh, the more we can communicate and collaborate together on this stuff, the better. So, for example, um, oh, average food sales in Kelowna per person is seven thousand one hundred and seventy dollars. So you know that you can try and target seven hundred dollars a year from that person as a reasonable assumption. As a market, as a vendor. Uh, there's income, daytime population, nighttime population, discretionary and disposable income, uh, occupations, levels of schooling, everything. So the, the daytime and nighttime population is very interesting. I've 
we're working with Cedar Farmers Market, we're entertaining the idea of a weekday market. So we're looking at the daytime population of Nanaimo as opposed to the nighttime population of Nanaimo. Do we want to have a market available when everyone's in town or if everybody's come home? So it's all these little things to take into account. Big picture, uh, demographics really help a lot with that. Um, you know, these, won't, these won't influence the, the, the purchasing on their own, but they definitely give you a bit of resource to, to help with your innovation. We're from the Squamish area, and we've been researching, we're moving actually up to the Caribou interior area, and we've been researching our market up there and seeing, because it's very different from the Squamish market, there's a lot more of our generation in the Squamish market, whereas there isn't as much in the 100 mile market, so we're kind of checking out our demographic, and so it's really interesting, like that, I've been searching a lot on the internet, me, me and our generation, I do a lot of stuff online, and that was one big thing that I found, was trying to figure out the demographics and what people are interested in, and I'm wondering if there's anything else aside from that as a resource, as far as what is lacking in those communities. Like, is there a way, other than talking to your clientele and being at your markets, is there a way to find information <coughs> out there from what is lacking in the market? Yeah, I'll, I'll take I think in our experience, we just kind of look at the vendor list and go, yeah. okay, well, we don't have that, so. Yeah, so yeah. 100, 100 mile is gonna be a little more more challenging definitely than if you yeah. have to look at what Vancouver's like and where we or mainland in general. Um, you need to look at who the influencers are in the area. Talk to the chef in the area. Really start to dissect what the palate is like. Yeah. The chef will be more than happy to vent on you and, and, and tell you all the challenges that he or she is having. Yeah. You know, I really I really want to make this, I just can't get it to move. You know, this is what the staff end up eating every week. Whereas he's going to know, or she's going to know what is moving every week and, and, and what the consumers are, are asking for. So look outside of the farm to market, look at food blogs, look at the food articles in the local paper, look at the chefs, uh, look at social media in the area, there's, there's food guilds and so on. Just, you know, you type in the area, type in food on, on the internet and you got to go deep, you got to go like 20 pages deep in the Google search in order yeah. to start getting those little obscure bits of data. But yeah. Well, so things cool. like the 100 mile farmer swap and shop and yeah, we look exactly. at all of those yeah. kind of things to see kind of how much is out there, who's trying to sell their stuff, what are they doing? Yeah. We use all those weird little resources. So. Yeah. Sorry, just to build on the market research in some of the smaller rural communities in Central Interior, um, it's actually fairly easy uh, if you know the right places to go. So one of them is Northern Development Initiative Trust. They put out community profile brochures for each of Northern Development Initiative Trust communities under miles one. Sorry, can you say that slower? Northern Development Initiative Trust puts out community profile brochures for each of the communities in their region. Um, and that includes, uh, which is most important if you're looking for young people in their interior, which is the employers. Um, young people congregate around employment opportunities in Northern BC, and so it, I know who the biggest employers are in 100 Mile, and that's where your market is. Um, there's also very few um, community and social spaces in smaller communities, so typically everyone goes to the pool, everyone goes to the art gallery if there's one, everyone goes to the library if there's one. So it actually makes your work very easy if you can figure out where those spaces are, and uh, I'd be happy to talk with you offline about that as well. And there's somebody else from 100 Mile here too. I mean, not there you are. Yeah, so um, yeah, that's nice to know. Well, that's it. Thank you very much.